All right, let's see how this Gorgon drawing turned out. Oh. Oh my. Oh no. What? Why? Why would I? Welcome to MapCrow, the RPG art show. My name is Kyle, and today we're talking about how to use mythological monsters in your RPG. If you have seen any of my videos on building better monsters, you may already know about Monstrous, which is an RPG book that will help you tell the stories behind the stat blocks of the monsters in your game. So if you like this drawing or some of my other monster drawings, you'll want to head to the link in the description below to find out more about the project, download the preview PDF, and sign up for the newsletter alerts. The monsters of mythology are an attempt to lyricize, to poetically look at the world around them and help the world make a little bit more sense in some way. But I feel that a lot of tabletop RPGs that use monsters from mythology like Medusa, like Gorgons, kind of mangle that poetry. Games like Dungeons and Dragons and Pathfinder and other games that follow in that tradition have a sort of preoccupation with applying scientific taxonomy to mythical monsters. One of my favorite RPG writers, Zedek Xiu, writes on their blog about this very issue in a blog post called D&D's Obsession with Taxonomy. I would like to read from this post if I may. The author says, what the nerd approach to taxonomy, a dragon is not a wyvern, does well is to make a field of knowledge or phenomenon predictable, quantifiable. This is the way the world is. Therefore, understandable, I know the world. Therefore, possible to act on, I know what to do with the world. You can solve it, apply best practices to it, optimize it, own it, possess it. Definitive taxonomies like goblin slash hobgoblin slash bugbear is better for you because then you can shorthand these creatures into three separate discrete scripts instead of Goblin people come in lots of different sizes. Some are big, some are puny, some are kind, some are not. It all depends, you just gotta pay attention to each one, which makes things messier, more unpredictable, meaning you have to pay attention, exercise discretion and empathy more, possibly accommodate new perspectives. I know the bugbear better than it knows itself. I got this, versus, okay, so how do I get to know Miss Goblin better? Apologies to everyone and the author for discovering my own emphasis in that reading from that blog post. And I'll have a link to that post in the description below. You should read the whole thing, it's wonderful. But to build off of this idea about how scientific taxonomy interacts with how we perceive the game world and the possibility spaces therein, um, let's talk about also how games talk about gods and moral or cosmic alignments. What is the D&D alignment of the Greek god Zeus? Zeus both enforces his law in his rules on the entirety of the universe and also does basically whatever he wants, whenever he wants. He is neither lawful nor chaotic, nor is he good or evil. The one thing that my understanding of Greek mythology demonstrates to me about Zeus is that he is powerful. And therefore, my role as a mortal would be to do whatever it takes not to get on his bad side. And monsters are a part of that conversation. Oftentimes, monsters in mythology are examples of what happens when you get on the bad side of the gods. Let's look at Medusa the Gorgon for instance, just to, just to pick an example out of thin air. So there's lots of legends and myths and snippets about Medusa that have been told and retold and reinterpreted and reappropriated over thousands of years. So there is no like canonical Medusa. It is a conversation, a tradition of associated imagery. It is full of multiplicity and subjectivity reflecting as many people as have retold the stories. And in this way presents a challenge to be incorporated into a definitive monster manual entry like in Dungeons and Dragons. 
But to be specific, let's pick the stories concerning Medusa as put down in the Metamorphosis of Ovid around the eighth year of the Common Era in Rome. Now the Gorgons are already known as a group of immortal demigods, of which Medusa is just the most famous because she shows up in the tale of Perseus. Now, Medusa, through really no fault of her own, attracts the ire and jealousy of Minerva, or as we would call her in Greek mythology, Athena. And Medusa's golden, gorgeous hair is turned into snakes, and that horrible visage turns any who look upon her to stone. Now, what? What poetically is revealed about the nature of the world through this story? What resonance does this have in your heart? Forget what it says about the theology of the Greeks or the Romans. When you hear this, what does it make you feel? For my part, it makes me wonder, why do bad things happen to good people? Or why do the good die young? There's this sort of inherent unfairness and cruelty and fickleness of fate that we experience as humans that I think this story is getting at. So as a game designer or a dungeon master, I want to try to figure out how to carry those questions along with the monster into my game. And the fun part of activating old stories and mythological images in a contemporary game is you get to play with the resonance of those symbols in a contemporary conversation. Both the tradition and text of Dungeons and & Dragons and Pathfinder have no qualms whatsoever of exterminating this dangerous monster that lurks in the shadows of the world. And for that matter, neither does Perseus. After all, the, le the legends and poems uh, about the slaying of Medusa don't really spend too much time shedding tears for poor Medusa. But in the games that I like to run and with the players that I enjoy playing, with, if they are presented with this basic narrative context, they will think thoughts and have feelings and perhaps come up with some alternate solution to the problem before them besides the extermination of Medusa. So to accentuate this unfairness and lack of control over her own destiny that Medusa seems to have in my reading of these myths, I have sort of mashed together. I've kit bashed a couple of different images that I've seen in uh, classical art uh, to give my version of Medusa, my version of the Gorgon, sort of this more terrible spin. And also to change things up and avoid the familiar imagery of the Gorgon, I decided to attach this snake-haired winged lady's head to the top of this giant ogre body that really references some of the other depictions of Gorgons throughout like Roman iconography. I think there's something truly horrific about being tethered to this, you know, cannibal giant idiot that uh, ambles around whatever kind of swamp or ruin it's taken root in, and there you are, just perched upon its shoulders, screaming out warnings to get away. I don't know, I just think that would be more fun for me than a uh, kind of reenacting scene from Ray Harryhausen's wonderful work in Clash of the Titans. But that's because I can't help myself. I'm an artist and a tinkerer, and I enjoy fixing things that ain't broke. The other thing that I would do to freshen up my take on Medusa is to get in into a specific fable from the Metamorphosis of Ovid again, uh, where Perseus is confronting Atlas. And Perseus in this story is asking for hospitality and a place to rest in his journey, and Atlas is not having it. Uh, so there, after this altercation and back and forth, Perseus says, since my friendship is of so little to thee, accept this present. And then turning his face away, he exposed on the left side of the horrible features of Medusa. Atlas, great as he is, became a mountain. Now his beard and hair are changed into woods and his shoulders and hands become mountains and ridges. And what was formerly his head is the summit of the top of the mountain. His bones become stones, and then enlarged on every side, he grows to an immense height. So you willed it, ye gods.
gods and the whole heaven with so many stars rests upon him. I just love the language and images from that story, and I think it would be really interesting to also add in these ideas of like trees and stars and all these other symbols of nature being associated with people petrified by the Gorgon's gaze. Although I love these games and I love these monsters, I am perpetually unsatisfied by the answers that taxonomy gives me as a storyteller and dungeon master. And I don't think my idea ideas are particularly better than anyone else's. I just like them better because they're mine. Just like I think you will like your ideas better because they're yours, because they carry through your subjectivity, your point of view, what you think is interesting or moving about these stories that we are retelling in a modern context. So this is my proposition to you. Find the images that compel you and the poetry that stirs your heart and put that into your game rather than inheriting the traditions and assumptions of the people who just happen to write your monster manual of choice. So that's the show today. Thank you so much for watching and please check the links in the description below for some of the resources that I mentioned and to also check out Monstrous and download your preview pack and see what you think of what we're putting together. So until next time, my friends, farewell. And welcome to the After Crow. This is the part of the show where I just want to thank my patrons and respond to some of the comments and questions that I've been getting in various places like Patreon and like the comment section of these videos. Um, probably the top repeat question that I got on the last video was, what is that cylinder that is around all of my pencils? And you will see this in the bottom of the description. And uh, I, if I know I'm going to be drawing for an extended period of time, I will put this thick foam around these pencils to help with wrist strain. I am entering my 40s pretty soon. And um, I, if I want to be drawing for for an, another, you know, couple of decades, I need to start really taking care of my body. These are the things that don't occur to you necessarily if you're an emerging artist, you know, in your 20s, but you know, it's, it's uh, not the age, it's the mileage, as they say. I also get a lot of questions about what kinds of pencils that I use. If you see me using a pencil that is painted yellow on the outside, it's just something I got in a 48 pack at, you know, Target or something like that. I don't really use special pencils. They have different softness ratings. Uh, so the regular pencils are going to be HB, but if you see me smudging um, graphite around, I'm probably using a 6B or an 8B pencil, like what you saw me using in the video today. Other than that, I, I might be using charcoal on some of these like more smudgy things. And I'm always working on Bristol board and you can check uh, the the description below for what kind of Bristol board that I'm using. It's it's Strathmore, um, like 110 pound, something like that. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions or comments, uh, and I notice that they're repeating a lot, I might answer them in the after crow like this. So yeah, until next time, see ya.